podcast is a production of Widener Law Commonwealth in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. For more information, visit commonwealthlaw.widener.edu slash podcast. Now here's your host, Julie Sheldon. <laughs> Welcome to Widener Law Commonwealth's podcast. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Today we have with us Tom Foley, who is the Director of Admissions. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the ELSA and also law school prep, uh, what applicants can do to set themselves up best for success when they're coming into law school. Uh, but first, I wanted to introduce Tom. You're a little bit new to the Widener Law Commonwealth family. When did mm-hmm. you start? In January. Okay. And um, where did you come from? Where were you before? I uh, was at Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia for seven some years Okay, as assistant director of admissions. Okay. And now what is your role within the admissions department? What, what, What is your function there? A few hats. One is recruiting. And during the fall, as well as sometime during the spring, but during the fall, it's recruiting season. Uh, so that includes going out to different uh, events and visiting campuses, talking with uh, students who are interested in law school. Also, I uh, coordinate events here on campus. So we invite students, uh, prospective students, to uh, come to campus and experience what law school is like. And uh, I participate in, in in preparing all the marketing information that we have, uh, whether uh, it's uh, something we mail out, something we hand out, something we have online, that sort of thing. And then moving into uh, the application season, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, I, along with the Associate Dean of Admissions, together we look at files. And we participate in conversations we have with our admissions committee on particular applicants. Mm -hmm. I also communicate with uh, applicants as far as if they have questions, if there's something missing from the file, how can how can they improve uh, their their uh, application profiles, things like that. And we do also have uh, events uh, during that time as well. And so we'll invite, again, prospective students, and we also have particular events for admitted students. And uh, then towards, uh, as we move into summer, it's working with these admitted students to uh, follow up with them and help them get their receipt deposit in, help them prepare on what they need to do, whether it's financial aid or find housing or assortment of things to get ready to actually matriculate in, in August. Okay, great. Well, and it sounds like, you know, some people may just think, oh, admissions, they just get the file and that's it. But, you know, there's a huge round the round year circle there is. process that goes into that. Um, so part of that circle is the LSAT. Yes. Uh, let's move into talking about that. Can you explain what the LSAT is and why it's important? Sure. The, the uh, law school admissions test uh, is a test that does not uh, test a person on their knowledge but on their thinking skills. And that's the first thing that uh, test takers need to understand is that uh, there's no base knowledge that they need to prepare for this. What they need to prepare for is, is how to think and how to be good test takers. Um, I talk to a lot of prospects who admittedly say, I'm not a good test taker, and I completely understand that. However, there's going to be a lot of tests in law school. And mm-hmm. then you have this thing called the bar exam. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty small, good test. Small yeah, thing, that's right? exactly <laughs> exactly right. So learn how to be be a good test taker. Okay. And LSAT in particular is is asking questions on logical, analytical reasoning components and how to read and decipher information from a body of text. And that's what lawyers do. And so it's really measuring how this test taker uh, processes that. There are uh, five sections in in the LSAT. Uh, Two of them are logical reasoning. One is analytical reasoning. Uh, And then there's another section that uh, could be either analytical or logical reasoning that is not scored, and I can explain that in a moment. And then there's the writing section that's also not scored. The one section that's not scored is where LSAC uses uh, questions to test uh, upcoming questions. So they have a whole team 
that comes up with all these different questions and for them to validate that these are good questions, that they work, they put them in the actual test to see how they're kind of like practice tests for them. So those aren't scored. And then the writing section is not scored either. Okay. And now you said LSAC, L-S-A-C yes. versus L-S-A-T. Can you explain the difference in exactly. that? There's a lot of the, acronyms that go there, around. There, there really are. LSAC, L-S-A-C is the Law School Admissions Council. They are a self-governing uh, body. Uh, actually, the law schools have tremendous input on how that organization functions and they do a number of key components. One is they coordinate all the applications with the law school. So when someone applies, they are actually applying through LSAC, and they can then apply to different schools throughout the country through them. Uh, also, an applicant's transcripts and letters of recommendations go to LSAC, and again, that organization will coordinate those materials. They analyze it, the transcripts, and they provide law schools with a breakdown of transcripts and GPAs and that sort of thing to various law schools. And they also administer the LSAT, the okay. law school admissions test. So that's another big uh, uh, function that LSAC does. And why and how do law schools use the test scores in the admissions process? Uh, why couldn't they just use a GRE, a GRE. or any other standardized test? That. And there's talk about that. And, and some schools are exploring the GRE, but not many. And uh, the past few months, I've gone to a couple workshops where they've talked about that, and there's no hard evidence yet. They're still looking at it. But the ILSAT is a very reliable and a very valid test. And they know that because ILSAC – the council, after a test, they will run correlation uh, studies on the uh, person who took the LSAT and how that person performs in law school. So they take that data and they are able to really drill down and see that there is a positive correlation between the score a person gets on the LSAT and how they perform in law school. Okay. And that's exactly what the LSAT does is it predicts how a person's going to do in law, the first year of law school. And then you can go even further and say the first year of law school is going to predict how that person does in law school overall. Mm -hmm. And then how a person does in law school overall, how they're going to do on the bar exam. So you can kind of follow that path down the road. But, but uh, LSAC does... They have a huge team of nerds, if I can <laughs> say sure. that, and they look at the nerds data. They look at the data and they do these correlation studies on a regular basis. And the ABA standard says that a law school has to provide a valid and reliable test to determine who, if their applicant will be successful in law school. And so this is absolutely, it's valid in that it has that positive correlation. And it's also reliable in that it's a good standardized test. So if the same person takes it over and over and over, they are going to score within the same range, a score each time they do that. Likewise, uh, a person who's taken the test in New York and the person who's taken the test in California has taken the exact same test and the exact same conditions and everything. So really the LSAT is the only true component of an application file that we can measure people against each other. Okay. We know that someone who took the LSAT a year ago and a person who took the LSAT a couple months ago at different places, one in California, one in New York, we know that they took pretty much the same test, the same mm -hmm. sort of questions and scored pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. Whereas other factors of the application file uh, is, is varied. Mm -hmm. You know, people go to different undergraduate schools. They have different majors. They've taken it dif different circumstances, different years, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and so I would imagine that there is a fair amount of – preparation because you want to get the best score that you right. can. Let's go into how is the test scored. Let's maybe jump ahead a little bit because those test scores are important. Can you explain the numbering and scoring system that they use on the LSAT? Uh, 
Yes. To and the again, best of your ability. Again, it can be very, very the, confusing. The nerds at LSAC could probably do it better than I can. Uh, but uh, the score is ranges from a 120 to a 180. The national average score is a 151. And, again, these scores, uh, there were, there's 100 to 102 multiple choice questions. And... It's not always the right answer, but it's the best answer sometimes, which makes it a little mm-hmm. bit tougher. And um, so if somebody scores a 150, um, then they're right in the middle of the pack, if you will. But each, each school has its range, if you will, of what their average and me, median uh, uh, LSAT score is. And if someone takes it over and over, you don't want to. The ideally, you want to take it once, do your very, very best, mm-hmm. and forget about it. But um, if for whatever reason a person feels like they could do better, then they can uh, retest. Law schools will get all the, all the tests. And uh, an LSAC score remains good for five years. So once in a while I see it, and I highly discourage it, but some people just want to wing it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, go- I'm a good test taker. I had to grade on my SAT. And you find out that they didn't do so well. And the problem is that score will stick with them. For at least five years. For five years, exactly. So so when they do study and prepare and they score much higher, then we have two scores that are outside that range. You know, each person, if, if they were to retest, they would be within a range of maybe four or five points. But if somebody is outside of that five-point range, I would like to know what happened. Mm-hmm. I want to know... The, did you have, you know, bad seafood the night before in your first test and yeah. you just weren't feeling well? Or did you actually study the second time? Mm-hmm. Explain to me which, which score I need to pay attention to. And like most, school, most law schools, we do use the highest score. Okay. Years ago, it used, it, we were required to average that out, which really hurt the that applicants. That would hurt somebody, that, yeah. It really does. But now we get to use the, the high score, however – we still get the other score, and we want to understand what happened with that score. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about preparation. What are the preparation resources that are available for for potential students? Well, LSAC offers two things. One is um, in, any uh, test taker can request prior tests to be sent to them, and LSAC will do that. They will send them tests that have been used a couple years ago, and the and the person can sit down at their convenience and sit down and practice these tests and score themselves and find out what areas, you know, is it the logical, what's called, a lot of, a lot of uh, applicants call it the games, logic mm-hmm. games. It's logical reasoning or the analytical reasoning uh, or the reading comp- comprehension, which, which areas they need to improve on. So LSAC will send those to a, a test taker at no cost. And also, LSAC has just partnered with Khan Academy, which is a big national and probably international uh, online learning service. It's completely free, again. So those are two free uh, options that's offered through LSAC. Now, there are businesses throughout the country that prepare students for whether it's the LSAT or it's the GRE or it's the GMAT and various tests. Mm -hmm. Those cost money. Uh, some of them is online. Some of it's materials that you receive in the mail. Some of it you actually go to classes. Uh, and each each uh, person learns differently. And so those that are able to learn online are certainly can do that. Others feel a need that they want to go in and have an instructor or have a coach and have another body that they can talk with and, mm-hmm. and talk things through. Um, so there's plenty of options out there. Again, there's the cost difference is, is pretty great. So whatever the person is, thinks that he or she needs, uh, that's an option to them. Another option is um, coming to a mock LSAT. And that was going to be where I was going to go next. Now, we offer. Mm-hmm. We do. Uh, and this year, we're going to hold two of them. Right. We already had one okay. recently, and the other's coming up December 1st. Okay. And we'll have these on a regular basis through uh, each year. This is a good, really good opportunity to uh, get a measurement of where a person stands on the LSAT because it's one thing to, and it's a good thing, to sit at home 
at the dinner table and sit down and time yourself and go through the go through the test. But it's a different thing when you have to get up at a certain time and you have to be somewhere and you have to drive a couple hours to get that per, to get to that place at a certain time and it's like a dress rehearsal. It, it, that's exactly that's exactly okay. what it is. A full dress rehearsal and you come in and you're not keeping the clock. I'm keeping the clock in this case. And you have the actual conditions of sitting in a room with other test takers. Uh, you don't have the doorbell go off. You're, you know, the dog's, dog's not going to be barking to one out, go mm-hmm. outside or whatever it is. Uh, so this is a really good dress rehearsal, as you said, to see where a person is. And is there, I imagine there's no penalty. They can take mock LSATs. Absolutely. As, as many long, as they want. Correct. And this seems like a really valuable it is. free tool. It is free. That... Yep. You know, and you get to see our beautiful campus when you come to you them do, as You well. do, exactly but, right. But um, I would think that these are just invaluable for students that are getting ready to take an outside. Exactly. And, and the test that we have uh, that administered already and the one coming up in December were actual tests used in 2017. So these are actual tests. That's ex- you're replicating the, sit- the situation of sitting down and taking the test as much as you possibly can. And uh, that's that's the one of the best ways, if not the best way, to prepare for the LSAT. About what is the length of the LSAT, a mock LSAT or, or a true LSAT? Uh, the total length would be a little bit over three hours. Okay. Yeah, th- there is a break okay. uh, between the third and fourth sections, a small, short break. Um, and now you had mentioned that sometimes there's changes to the LSAT. I would imagine to keep it fresh and making sure that right. those questions are, are still achieving their true goal. Yep. Are there upcoming changes to the LSAT that are anticipated, or do we know ahead of time if there's going to be changes? There, there, there are some coming up. One is um, currently a, a test takers need a number two pencil, and a piece of, and, the, and the test is fill in the bubble sort of thing, mm-hmm. as we did, as I did years ago. Um, but they are moving to a tablet. So they are going to integrate this coming year. It will be at first on a volunteer basis. Uh, to test takers, but there's an actual tablet that a test taker would get, and they can go through each question one at a time. The tablet will, you'll be able to highlight, you'll be able to note, you'll be able to flag questions if you want to go back to it later. You'll actually be a timer on there. So uh, once, you know, each section is 35 minutes, so once it begins, that timer starts counting down, so Mm -hmm. a person can watch the time on that. So it's really nice. They They really thought this through, and they... They have uh, now an electronic version of the test, and they will roll that out sometime in 2019, and again, it'll be on a volunteer basis, but the goal is, is within a couple years, to have that as the primary uh, method of taking the test. Now, if somebody, for whatever reason does not want to use the, the tablet, they can still use the paper test. That was my next question, because everybody takes tests a they little do. differently, they do. and sometimes you know, a screen versus a paper makes right. a big difference for right. someone. It does. Uh, another item that that's changed is uh, now they've added more tests to the calendar year. It used to be just four tests a year, but now there's six. Uh, and they spread them out a little bit differently. So there's uh, September, which is coming up very close. And November, January, March, and then two in the summer. There's two in the summer, still one in June, which has always been. And they added one in July. The one in July is intended for the next fall, the uh, the next uh, incoming class for the following year. So July of 2019 is actually intended for matriculation of fall 2020. Okay. And so now, as we're talking about the LSAT, which is, of course, a large step in our preparation for law school, let's talk a little bit about some of the other preparations that uh, prospective students have to go through. Mm -hmm. Um, If I'm an undergrad student and I'm thinking, I don't really know what I want to do, but law school may be interesting to me. How does your major really matter when you're completing your undergraduate degree? Should you really focus on doing a pre-law program? Are you, I don't know, put lower in the pile for maybe having an economics degree versus, you know, a pre-law program degree? Uh, Not at all. The requirement is that you have completed a bachelor's degree by the time you matriculate into law school. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, most students have that pre-law or government degree or criminal justice or s- something along that line just because of their interest. They're already mm-hmm. interested in law school and their interest takes them that way, which is fine. But you can have a bachelor's degree in music. You can have it in a language. You can have it in a science or engineering or art, whatever, whatever it it, it really does not matter. Um, my my thought is is um, for someone who's just entering undergraduate or is maybe a freshman and still has trying to decide what major to this, to pick. My suggestion is that if law school is not in your plans, if law school is plan A, then what's plan B? And if you don't want to be a lawyer, maybe you want to be an art teacher, which is absolutely wonderful. Then you should major in art and education. You should, because you can still use that degree and still go to law school. So if for whatever reason law school doesn't pan out as a person has hoped or planned, they have a degree in something that's really going to mean a lot to them, that's going to be useful to them, and and whatever their plan B career might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, still, if it's pre-law, if it's uh, uh, criminal justice or whatever, that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I do encourage undergraduate students to take s- – There's most schools allow students to take so many electives. Mm-hmm. And there's some electives that would really be helpful – for those entering in the law school. One would be a uh, philosophy class. Another would be a literature class. In fact, uh, the people in LSAC who put together the questions, almost all of them, a <laughs> uh, large majority of them, are either philosophy majors or literature majors. Oh, that's interesting. So that's the mindset that the the test is built on so that'd be really good to get a philosophy class a literature class language is a good thing because language is uh it has rules and you have to construct sentences and and that sort of thing and that's kind of what law school is about as well uh, statistics is another good class uh you're again uh you're getting data and you're arranging it in different ways to mean different things so there's a, there are some classes that a person could take as electives that would be very beneficial. Even if there are a art education major, you can still take those electives and mm-hmm. be prepared for law school. And say you are that student that knows that this is that you want to go into law school. Mm-hmm. What are what's the value of having maybe some extracurricular activities like a pre law club oh, right. or a pre law advisor? Yeah, absolutely. You you don't have to be a pre-law major to be in a pre-law society or a club. You can, you know, whatever your major is, you can still be a part of that. The big plus is is that they're they're going to have resources available. Uh, The pre-law advisor is kind of in touch with various law schools. They understand the changes that are being made in in the in the LSAT. in fact, some pre-law clubs will have a, their own mock LSAT sometimes, mm-hmm. and they'll go on trips to different law schools and that sort of thing. So you're really plugged in to a really good resource to help you uh, prepare for the test and, and, and uh, preparing your best you can academically for law school. And uh, so we have, um, of course, you know, law schools for individuals of, of all ages, of course, mm-hmm. after they've received that undergraduate degree. How would somebody who is interested in changing careers, maybe they're already in their career, but they would like to transition, come to law school, how would you tell them to best prepare themselves? Because they may have a very different situation. Perhaps they have families that are a little older than what we would call, quote, traditional law students. Um, How do they get started in this process? Uh, First thing I I share with someone is this is a big life-changing event. Um, If you have a family and you're used to going to the park on Saturdays or going to the ball games or doing that sort of thing, your life is going to change. And you need to make make it clear with your family that uh, you're going to be spending many hours in the law school library and in study groups and and that sort of thing. So preparing uh, the change in life as far as, you know, how involved you are in family or in your community, that's that's one aspect you got to look at. Financially, uh, 
you know, make sure your financial things are in order. You don't have to be completely out of debt, but you have to be in a good place. Uh, law school is extremely stressful. The first year or the first semester is the most stressful. And the last thing you want is more stress at home. Mm-hmm. You want to minimize that as much as you possibly can. So making sure that financially you're stable, you're in, you're in good shape, uh, your family and your friends understand that you're not going to be around as much as you used to be. Um, if you have to relocate, uh, then, then you have a whole housing situation you have to look at. So these, these big life things that are outside the law school, uh, just make sure those are in order. And uh, if there's any issues, just kind of resolve those before you get into law school. Because once you get into law school, you want to put everything you have into it. And I would assume that that would, would cross over to any student as far as getting yourself in line financially, making sure right. that, you know, you're set up for success, essentially. Yes, yes. Okay. I encourage all incoming students to uh, run a credit check on themselves. Um just to make sure that there's no surprises out there. Mm -hmm. You know, that happens once in a while, and it takes a while to get that corrected. Uh, But, again, uh, and to take a little bit of time just before school starts, uh, just before, you know, uh, you matriculate in August, uh, whether that's a really nice vacation or if you want to go and backpack through Europe or Canada, that's the time to do it because, again, once you get into law school for those next few years – you're going to be uh, focusing and hungering down on that. So it would be a good time to, you know, again, you're not going to see your friends and family as much. That would be a great opportunity to spend some quality time with the people that you care about uh, before you get into the books. Okay. Um, And let's talk a little bit about visiting the law school. Um, That's a huge part, I would assume, because you you want to know if this is going to be the right fit for for you and even your family because they usually say everybody goes to law school in the family. Right. That is is huge. Uh, Most law schools are very similar in many ways. You know, the same courses, the same curriculum and programs in in some ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's different is the actual – the culture, the location, the size – and, and that sort of thing. So you can go to a, a, a law school that has an incoming class of three or 400 people and kind of be lost in the crowd. Mm-hmm. And some people like that. Here, uh, our class is 125. You're not going to get lost in the crowd. People are going to know you. Professors are going to know you. Uh, the location, uh, you got the big city, which has its pluses. Uh, but here in, in Harrisburg, where it's state capital, cost of living is very affordable. Uh, you don't have the traffic issues that you have or some of the other things that the big city has. So uh, you really want to visit the camp, you know, the, the few law schools that you really have an interest in and just get the feel of the culture. Uh, talk with professors. Talk with students. Uh, you know, we also law schools pre- – provide a nice view book with smiley faces and Mm -hmm. happy students and all this kind of stuff. But you really need to set foot on the campus to really get a feel of what it's like and what that culture is. And as you mentioned, you want the right fit. Mm -hmm. uh, Not everyone is going to be successful at uh, Harvard. Not everyone's going to be successful at Penn State. So you need to find that place where you are going to be the most successful and be happy and really have a great experience. Awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit. We did a little bit talk about, uh, setting an attitude for success. Uh, can you just give us a quick rundown of maybe the top three things that you think may be, or the top five things that are the most important for setting up a prospective student for success in law school? Yeah. Uh, one thing that I I share with students that are coming in is that obviously you come to law school, which means you have been successful in undergraduate. At, at, the, at the undergraduate level, you've done great there, so which is a good thing. Uh, but what, when someone's used to getting a 3.6 GPA at undergrad and just kind of having a great time, uh, and suddenly they come to law school and they have a 2.6, and they're wondering what happened. What's they feel like a failure? Well, you're not a failure. You're actually in the middle of the road there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just understanding how law school grading works and and that, and that when you come to law school, everyone's smart, 
and uh, everyone works hard. And just having that reality check that I'm I'm okay with the 2.6 or whatever I end up with, and uh, not to be feel bad. Not it's 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 hard to take someone who's been successful in high school and college and do all this stuff suddenly they come to law school and they realize that uh, it's it's a different I'm, ball game it's, it's, you it's have to study different differently ball. and, you and do. use and the, your, your and the GPA is going to be different and your ranking is going to be different another is to come in with a little bit of fear uh, it's it's a little bit of fear is healthy mm-hmm. and it's it's quite okay you know uh, to not know anything because you're going to come in you're going to figure it out and uh, it takes a while to figure it out. It takes it takes a good semester to figure out how much time do I need to to read and do I need to reread or do I am I involved in study groups and how does that work and and these sorts of things. So it is a different game, and uh, to come in with a little bit of fear and and some openness, be willing to learn, be very teachable, not only in the content that you're you're receiving, but how to research and how to write and how to read and all these sort of things. It's very different. Uh, come in uh, as part of a community. Uh, I've only met one person in all the years I've been doing this that has actually said, I made it through on my own. He he just had a very unique personality, mm-hmm. and he said it on his own. But most people, if almost all of them, uh, it's a community effort. They get together in study groups. They share notes together. They help each other with things. So come in as part of of the Widener Commonwealth community and um, not only to receive, but to contribute. Um, Our listeners know that I like to end with kind of a fun question. Um, I actually have two. I know that I briefed you on one. (laughs) My first one is, have you ever taken the LSAT or have you taken one of the mock LSATs ever? I have not. Okay. Uh, I always thought that would be interesting. I I have not, but uh, I am – Intrigued with testing, I have a graduate degree in education, okay. and I took some classes in test and measurements. I've always been interested in, in how that works. Mm-hmm. And so when I went to the LSAC workshop recently and these nerds started talking <laughs> about I was, I was all in. Crunchers. I number was, crunchers. I was all in because I was fascinated on, on, how that, on how that all pulls together. Okay. And uh, my real fun question here is what is your favorite crime drama show? It can be television. It can be Netflix. (laughs) Netflix. Um, I'm going to have to go with two. Okay. Sorry. One is NCIS. Okay. uh, Primarily because I am from that area of Virginia Mm -hmm. and D.C. I know well. So whenever they go to a place somewhere in Virginia. You're looking in the background to figure (laughs) out where they are. I said, I know exactly where they are. I know exactly where that place is and that sort of thing. So it just kind of brought it home for me a little bit. Uh, So I enjoyed that. And then I've always loved Law & Order. I even have the boom boom on my phone. So that's my ringtone. Uh, (laughs) I like it. I like Law and Order because it, it does show both sides: the the law enforcement and the the, the uh, prosecution and and that sort of thing. But it ne- rarely does it end as I expect it. That's what I like so much about mm-hmm. it. It takes a turn or a twist or something, and the you know, first time you see it, you really do not know how it's going to end. And to me, that that's the reality. I mean that's the real life yeah. thing. It's 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 not a show that oh I know the 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 star is going to catch the the person. It's not and, like House where you know they're going to eventually make the person. That's better. exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. So you never know how it's going to end up, and sometimes it ends up great, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it takes a twist that you never thought of before. You say, wow, I didn't realize that that would impact it in such a way, and now whatever. So. Well, thank you so much for joining me today in our podcast. My pleasure. Uh, And I wanted to um, remind our listeners that we will have another podcast here coming up shortly, so please stay tuned. Widener University Commonwealth Law School is the Pennsylvania capital's only law school with three specialized centers of legal scholarship through its Law and Government Institute, Environmental Law and Sustainability Center, and Business Advising Program. Widener Law Commonwealth offers an exceptional learning experience that is personal, practical, and professional. Visit commonwealthlaw.widener.edu for more information.